This episode is sponsored by Verisk Marketing Solutions. The future of consumer experience requires a deeper data-driven understanding of identity, behavior, and privacy. Join marketing leaders and industry execs at the VIA 2023 Consumer Insights and Experience Summit, September 18th and 19th in Chicago's Fulton Market District. They'll explain how they can future-proof their businesses and do right by their customers with you. Spots are limited. Register now at marketing.verisk.com slash via. Keep in mind, we're still seeing, you know, uh, employment numbers, uh, pretty strong ones. So there, we haven't entered that phase of, yeah, where people might have to, you know, have no choice but to not travel. Hey gang, it's Tuesday, July 25th. Oscar, Zach and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e market podcast made possible by Verisk Marketing Solutions. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by two folks. Let's meet them immediately. We start with one of our directors of forecasting based out of New York. It's Oscar Orozco. Hello, hello, Marcus. Hey, fella. How are you? Good, sir. How are you? Doing well. We're also joined by someone else on the forecasting team, one of our senior analysts on that team based out of Colorado. That's correct, Marcus. Thanks for having me. Hello, listeners. Zach Goldner, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad you're based out of Colorado. Zach has lived everywhere uh somehow <laughs> and he's only he's crazy young but i'm glad that you live in colorado because my fact of the day is colorado related themed if you will if you weren't not from colorado but you're based there if you weren't based there then it would be pretty random <laughs> fact of the day i only Goodness. have the one so we're gonna have this regardless of where you're based at but i'm glad you're there uh so why is colorado called colorado because Spanish explorers named the river that ran through the area of Colorado, meaning colored red. So Colorado means colored red. Oscar, you're our Spanish speaker. Is that true? Uh, yeah, it, it's sort of. But yes, it, it means like it has colors. And okay. so I, I actually knew this. I know, oh, you, did? You, know, you know, You know me with my history, though. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe, maybe, you know. Uh, so yeah, colored red for its muddy red hue. And so eventually the territory became named Colorado. Yeah, that's the fact. Anyway, <laughs> today's real topic. Uh, are we back to traveling again? So in today's episode, first in the lead, we'll cover whether folks are back to their old vacationing ways. And then for in other news, we'll discuss whether gamifying shopping works and what to make of getting so many texts from brands from companies. We start with the lead, of course. So how long will this travel boom last? A recent Economist article asks this. It notes that after a rocky few years, the urge to splurge on airline tickets and hotels is set to bring in bumper earnings. Gents, there's a, a travel boom going on. How long will it last? Well, travel is back. But, you know, we said this also last year uh, as well, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's more back. Without, it's more back. Exactly. Um, you know, it was definitely busier last year than it was in 2021, uh, but it was still below pre-pandemic levels. I feel like people might not have realized that since there was so much pent up demand. Yes. Uh, but, you know, when you look even at car travel in the U uh, U.S. interstates last year, for example, it was still lower than in 2019. But it's totally back, totally back. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at a survey from TripIt. They found that 90% of Americans have traveled in the last three months uh, and about three quarters plan to fly domestically this summer. It's domestically, it's internationally. I think we can fully say that for the most part, travel is you know up or at the same level or above where we were in 2019. I mean, you mentioned car travel. One reason, I mean, gas prices, right? Record high of five bucks a gallon last year and a gallon of regular recently averaged about 360 according to AAA. So that's come down significantly. In over half the US states, gas is less than 350. So that's definitely helped road trips become more affordable this year. Yeah, and going along with tandem with the gas prices are airline tickets as well. So yep. airfares are going down. What we're seeing with that as well is I can imagine travel really booming as long as people are okay with going over the fiascos that have been happening in the travel industry. So as you may have remembered back in December 
of last year. There's a lot of chaos going on with Southwest Airlines. It still is happening with United too. Uh, but people are seeing cheaper airfares as long as they remain uh, lower than they were historically and the economy remains out of a recession. I can still see the momentum carrying forward and travel continuing to to boom. Yeah, the Southwest situation last year's yeah kind of mass cancellations left a bad taste in, in travelers' mouths, and a lot of that could have spilled into into this year. Twenty five percent of all U.S. flights were canceled or delayed last summer. And so people remember that and and so might be more resistant, hesitant to, to booking flights this year. And that costs a lot. Southwest Airlines estimated that cancellations of nearly 17,000 flights in December led to them incurring $800 million in losses. Uh, so that really adds up. I, I think that, you know, I mean, putting the positive spin on it, that it's not having much of an impact, you know. Uh, I think, sure, it left a bad taste in some travelers' mouths, but there's just so much pent-up demand, so much, you know, as we're seeing with the economy, we touched on that a little bit, people are definitely prioritizing, you know, essential goods, pretty much, and travel, you know, and experiences, right. things like that. And and that's uh, definitely what's driving just these high travel numbers that we're seeing. I mean, it's not just airlines. We've, we've seen it from hotel booking numbers out there that show that, you know, people are booking hotels at a high rate, or rentals, mm -hmm. uh, even even the cruise industry uh, for the first time in, in yeah. years, we're, get, we're hearing some positive signs from there. Very positive signs. I mean, that we everyone pronounced cruises kind of dead and gone uh, right after the pandemic. And Jacob Passy of the Wall Street Journal was noting that cruise lines are seeing occupancy levels above 100% on many ships, largely due to discounts and promotions that they offered last fall and winter. So that cruises are back. Exactly. I think it has a little bit to do with, you know, when we think of cruises, we do think of maybe older Americans. There was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole the fear about COVID was something that lingered for a while and that's de definitely dissipated. So I think some of these travelers are, are more comfortable traveling. Um, I've even heard from my own mom, who never would have wanted to go on a cruise. She's been telling me she wants to go on one, <laughs> which is surprising to me, but speaks to, you know, also people just want to get back out there and then cruises is, is another way to do it. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, there's a new cruise line. I want to say it's coming from uh, the Royal Caribbean. That's going to be five times greater than the Titanic. <sighs> Five times bigger. You're not going to catch me on that. Five times bigger. <laughs> I'm going to catch you on that. <laughs> that is um, humongous. <laughs> yeah, that's too big. But, I mean, Oscar, you mentioned pent-up demands. It's mm -hmm. easy to, to forget that last summer, last June, July, was just six months removed, six months away from Omicron, mm -hmm. COVID mm -hmm. uh, variant. And so summer last year, people were just kind of still reeling from that whole debacle and so this summer is the first real summer where or the, the summer's had a real kind of a good amount of runway and people had a good run up to the summer as opposed to still feeling a lot of the shocks uh from from that fiasco absolutely like there, there was a gallup poll from last uh, it was may 2022 said 40 percent of people had been avoiding travel by plane bus subway train all of it uh, because of COVID fears and this, the most recent survey they mm. did in February of this year that had fallen to eighteen percent. That's a very significant drop. So yeah. you know, a lot of people who, as you said, six months removed from Omicron, just were not ready to travel. Now, now are some of this tailwind is inflation related. The Economist was noting airfares are rising faster than inflation and so global airline bosses they say expecting nearly 10 billion in net income this year that's more than double the amount that was initially forecast according to the international air transport association however it's not just the dollars that look better number of passengers i mean oscar you mentioned you mentioned numbers not quite at pre-pandemic levels even if they'd gotten better one of those figures was uh, worldwide tourist arrivals worldwide mm -hmm. tourist arrivals this year expected to reach up to 95 percent of pre-pandemic levels last year they were at 63 according to the wow. un's world tourism organization and if you look in the us the federal transportation security administration tsa projecting that more people will board flights this summer than in 2019 so travel really starting to get to get back to those pre-pandemic levels close to at or some cases just above uh, it's interesting you mentioned the article, uh, Marcus. 
in, in that article as well, it does talk about how uh, the third largest travel group are uh, Chinese travelers. And roughly yeah. three quarters of those, even today, are still not willing to do international travel and go on their same uh, luxurious uh, travel locations that they would have pre-pandemic. And mm-hmm. said they're opting for staycations, which would not necessarily benefit the U.S. economy or the other markets that we may be looking uh, in our forecast. Yeah, that's a great point. The last point for me, Mark, is I, I would say keep in mind, right, it was May of this year, international passengers traveling here no longer have to show proof of vaccination, right? So uh, that's opening up the border for, for a yeah. lot of people who previously weren't able to, to enter the country. Yeah, it's a great point. And then environmental roadblocks haven't helped as well. Um, there's been fires in Canada, the smoke coming down, um, hitting vast parts of the, of the U.S., not to mention what they're doing in their kind of origin country of, of Canada and, and tornadoes in kind of the whole right half of the country have caused all kinds of delays. The Bureau of Transportation Statistics saying that just over 19%, 19% 19 of flights were delayed last year, and that's up a bit from 2018. So even when people are booking, things aren't going as smoothly as, as they once used to or as they're hoping that they will. How do we think economic climate is, is changing how people think about vacations? I, I think, you know, I mentioned it a bit earlier, it's not having as much of an impact just because, you know, the, the desire, the demand, the the necessity for certain people is just has overcome any maybe uh, issues that people might be dealing with economically speaking, uh, whether it's inflation or, you know, and also keep in mind, we're still seeing, you know, uh, employment numbers, uh, pretty strong ones. So there, yeah. we haven't entered that phase of, yeah, where people might have to, you know, have no choice but to not travel. Yeah. I will yeah. mention though, there's something we don't talk about often, but we're, we're you know, come September, all the student loan repayments are, are going to start again. Um, you know, point. of course, it's very possible that the situation might become a bit more dire. I'm I'm curious to see what holiday travel will look like. I, you know, it'll really be the the main sort of determinant on how the year plays out, right? Overall mm-hmm. for travel. I mean, I, but I think for sure summer travel is going to be heightened and high. But again, that holiday travel is what I think we should look out for. Yeah, and I, I'd like to call it the a uh, mix. A mixed impact of the economic climate mm-hmm. of its impact on travel. So, first thing is, is gasoline being lower than it was mm-hmm. last year. And you did comment that, but what that means is both airfares ha- have gone down, as well as people at home have got lower electricity costs, lower gas prices uh, point. for for their own homes. And that means more uh, discretionary income that they're mm-hmm. able to spend on travel. Mm-hmm. So with that, they may see more opportunity to go go out. But I think the other factor of why you're seeing more travel this year, too, is that during the pandemic, when people are staying inside for for a year or longer, the thing they want to do most is have experiences. They want to go see family. They want to go uh, to Mexico or to a new resort they've never been to. And with that, I think you've got both of those factors that have been helping inflate the travel industry this last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all great points. Oscar, going back to what you were saying about unemployment, you know, the fact that folks have jobs and so they have money to, to spend. Unemployment in the U.S. has been 4% or below for the last 18 months. It's not all bad when you look at the, the economic mm-hmm. backdrop. This year's changes to summer vacation plans due to inflation, according to a recent bank rate survey, Americans most likely, in terms of changes they're going to make to their summer vacation plans, they're most likely to select less expensive accommodation and then engage in cheaper activities on the trip. They're the ways they're most likely to change their plans because things cost more. Let's finish the lead gents by talking about the way people choose where they're going on vacation. So Gen Zers are basing their travel plans on where TV shows like White Lotus are set. Right, it's Grace Dean and Hannah Toey of our sister company, Business Insider. They note that when season one was broadcast, web traffic to the Four Seasons Macau Resort, which is featured in the show, uh, increased over 400% year on year, according to the COO. In addition to that, during season two, flight and hotel searches from the US to Sicily grew more than 50%, according to travel app Hopper. So, gents, uh, what do you make of the way people choose where to go on vacation 
changing. Is this a trend? Well, well Marcus, first of all, have you seen White Lotus? White Lotus? I've not, no. Not? If you were to see it, you'd want to book a travel stay there. <laughs> so I don't blame I, anyone. I don't know. But, Apparently, it's uh, it's not the cheapest hotel. Is it like 3500 some of the rooms go for? Yeah, there might, they it, might it be looked cheaper, like it. It, was it, did look, it did look I didn't good. say I could afford it, but <laughs> my manager, Oscar, could help uh, for a little bit better of a raise. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, but my, my take on this is we do live in a social media world. People mm-hmm. want to be able to talk about pop culture and what better of a way to talk about the place that they just watched it be filmed in, the, the setting of that. Yeah. So I think we're seeing this both for uh, media culture. The article also talked about how, how this has had impact for years, whether it's the Twilight series in Forks, Washington, uh, which I did go to when I was eight years old, and I've got a picture of me and the, the uh, Team Edward, <laughs> uh, Lord of the Rings uh, in New Zealand, mm-hmm. and, and other locations like that. So yeah. I think that's one uh, area of you're saying experiential travel of people wanting to relive and and be able to talk about uh, these places that they've been to. They're also in pop culture. Yeah. And I think the other element to this as well is people wanting to go to places that others are going as well. Um, and w- with that being said, I, I want to call out national parks being a big uh, attraction as well. What we've seen in the last year or last couple of years since COVID. Uh, national park visits have increased tremendously. But what you're seeing that is that impact is very isolated to the most popular of national parks. So those like Yellowstone, Arches, Zion, and the most popular trails and scenic viewpoints there are getting overloaded. And that's because hmm. other people want to go to it. They see it and they want to relive the same moment. Uh, and that that's where I uh, see travel going from there. Yeah, the trend's called set jetting. Uh, which I hadn't heard of, said to keep growing. American Express and Expedia listing it as one of the top travel trends for 2023 that um, Business Insider article was noting. Oscar, any thoughts here? Yeah, uh, to, to one of uh, Zach's points, I mean, it's really nothing new. I mean, we, we either um, take inspiration from our uh, loved ones or friends, but many times from what we see on TV, on the mm-hmm. big screen. And I I think a lot of, I was thinking a lot about the Griswold family and Chevy <laughs> Chase and the National Lampoon <laughs> vacations. Like when I was younger, I wanted to travel with them in one of these station mm-hmm. wagons around the, uh, around the world. So um, that's always been the case. Croatia, Croatia is still a hot location because of Game of Thrones. So yeah. um, I, I really think it's, it's uh, if brands are already not capitalizing, thinking about this from the brand's perspective, yeah. uh, you know, capitalizing on this, they, they really should, especially like hotels and resorts, yeah. you know. Um, I also thought it was fascinating. So there's a second article we were looking at for this in terms of the way people choose where to go on vacation and that changing. Julie Weed, freelance writer for the New York Times, was writing powerful new AI software is already shaking up the travel industry. But, it has, but she was saying that it has a long way to go until it can plan a seamless trip, AI software that is. However, she goes on to write, a quote, one day soon in the AI powered future, a vacation might start by telling your smartphone something like this. I want to take a four day trip to Los Angeles in June, whenever airfares and hotel rates are best using loyalty reward points. I want it to hit a history museum and an amusement park, and then I'd like a 7 p.m. dinner reservation near the hotel at a restaurant with vegan options and a great wine list, and then your phone spits out the perfect itinerary, close quote. I mean, maybe that's the direction we're going in. I wonder how you'd be able to tweak the options that it spat out. Maybe it gives you something being able to say, okay, actually, maybe we'll push the dinner re- reservations to a different time. Will it be like when you get your groceries delivered and they present different alternatives to what you initially bought? Maybe you can move it to 8 p.m. They've got an 8 p.m. or they've got, you know, it's not a history museum, but there is a cool art gallery nearby. But that, yeah, concept I think is fascinating in terms of the, the, the changing way that we, we might start booking things. Oh, we're seeing a booking.com, I believe, recently partnered with with chat gpt and they're trying to move yeah. conversational chat capabilities Expedia into the too, app i think Expedia Expedia, as well. yeah. so they're far farther along than what we're seeing uh, from other con- uh, companies yeah i mean i've used it myself oh you did on before my yeah before my last travel i was on tiktok as a young person my age would do and <laughs> i came across then a uh, generative ai 
travel guide. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I'm saying I'm going to be staying in this city for X amount of days. Find me different events to do uh, within an X mile radius of the city center. And it would give me the prices of each ticket for the people I'm going with and give me personalized recommendations. Yeah, it's not perfect, but unfortunately, that's the way that I believe that travel is going. At the very least, it can help you uh, generate some ideas and, and and create some inspiration for you to maybe then go and book for yourself so you can feel in complete control of all the different kind of nuances of the, of the trip. Um, let's end with this, Oscar. You guys are working on some numbers for how much money travel advertisers spend what are we looking at? We can tease an upcoming forecast for all the listeners. Uh, these numbers should be, you know, live on the site in about three weeks, I would say. So we're working on our industry ad spending uh, figures, digital ad spending. Uh, what we can say about uh, travel is that it is absolutely number one. It is driving digital advertising. All the travel companies are, are doubling down, tripling down on, on their uh, messaging we saw it in 2022 as well, uh, Marcus. I mean, uh, a company like Carnival has re reported that in 2022, they spent uh, year over year, their spend was up 120%. Uh, wow. 120 percent yeah booking and expedia both up over 45 percent so they're trying to target all all of the customers that are that are interested in traveling so uh travel will be number one um i would finish off by saying even on the publisher's side uh you know from alphabet meta even pinterest and snap i mean they've all mentioned travel as big big revenue drivers for them um, I know Alphabet launched a new performance max for travel goals, sort of uh, ad product for travel companies. And, you know, I think travel, even like I mentioned, Pinterest and uh, and Snap, travel are, are, are usually not brands that will advertise or, or utilize these publishers, but they are. And, and they mentioned that as emerging verticals for them. So uh, travel, number one. One other comment on our forecast. So we have just more than the US. We have UK, Germany, France, and coming out with this new update, we'll have travel by Canada as well. Nice. Brand new breakouts as well as an updated forecast. You can head to insiderintelligence.com to get access to that, of course. Um, that's what we've got time for for the lead. We're going to skip the halftime report. I want to get straight to the stories we have for you in the second half. So today in other news. Does gamifying shopping work? And what's make of brands that are texting us more? Story one, Amazon ran a TikTok game show as part of its Prime Day sales event. Jewel for Deals, as it was called, combined shoppable content in an interactive live streaming experience with a game show format. Sarah Karlovich of Marketing Dive notes that during the event, a bunch of TikTok influencers played a series of games while viewers worked cooperatively in the chat to unlock specific deals. This all took place on Amazon's TikTok channel where viewers could access the deals without leaving the app. But Zach, the most interesting sentence in this article is what and why? The most important sentence in this article to me is by utilizing TikTok on Prime Day, Amazon's able to generate social media engagement and organic buzz, while also allowing consumers to interact with both platforms simultaneously. So to me, this highlights the strategic significance that Amazon's collaboration has with TikTok and let's say other social platforms to come for, for Prime Day sales and, and maybe just for the platform in general. Mm -hmm. uh, but it also really emphasizes the value of social media engagement and the organic buzz from reaching and connecting to this younger audience. And I think that'll have a big impact on Amazon's goal of driving sales through also using customer interaction. Yeah, I thought this is an interesting concept. We talked about Prime Day on last week's Reimagining Retail show, and we talked about different flavors of Prime Day that we might expect to see, because they've got the one in the summer, they've got the one in October. And some of the suggestions that came out of that were maybe like a spring Prime Day, maybe one right after Christmas, like a New Year's Prime Day. One of the ones I was thinking of was kind of a gamified Prime Day where I went to university, they had a bar there and they had a game that they would play. It was basically they all the drink prices uh, would go up and down kind of like the stock market throughout the night. 
And so you would start with a pint of beer would cost, I don't know, like 250. And so if you thought that was a good price, you would go and get a pint of beer or you would wait to see the price come down and you'd be like, oh, prices, beer's at 150 right now. And you'd rush and grab one. Or if it shot up to five, uh, five pounds, you'd be like, oh man, I missed my chance. And so they kind of gamified it. And I thought that would be an interesting way to do Prime Day keeping people engaged with the site all day as they watch the price of that new TV that they want go up or down and they try to figure out when's the best time to buy it. You buy it maybe at $200 because you think it's not going to get any lower and maybe it keeps going to 100 and you're gutted because you're like, oh, I should have waited. Maybe it gets more expensive. So I thought, yeah, the idea of gamifying shopping, I think there's a lot that can be done there. Uh, story two, you're not imagining it. Brands are texting you way more, notes Emily Stewart of Vox. She writes that scrolling through her phone, she was surprised to see just how many of her texts were not from friends and family, but instead from companies. A package update from UPS makes sense, she says, but not the alert about a sale on items from Tory Burch, a brand she's never purchased. So Oscar, the, uh, the most interesting sentence from this article about brands texting us more is what and why. For me, the sentence was, you open your texts a lot more than you do your emails. And they cited... A third party data point in the article that found that open rates are incredibly high, 97% within 15 minutes of being delivered, uh, while email open rates are estimated to be at around 20%. So a huge, huge difference. I've noticed much, many more, you know, texts, uh, even on WhatsApp from, from brands and companies trying to reach me. Uh, so the reality is email boxes are littered with trash. Uh, and this is a very, very good opportunity for brands. It's a more expensive way to reach consumers, uh, but but it's something that they should lean more into. I would also say we see this internationally. Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, WeChat, around the world, uh, customers use these chat services to shop and interact with brands and for customer service reasoning. So it's a largely untapped market here, and I think it's an exciting one. Yeah, that's a great point. Some of the other data points one of the other data points from from this piece, people don't love them. They don't love texts from companies. A data company Validity found 96% of folks have felt annoyed at least occasionally by marketing text messages. However, that's people don't love. It's like advertising. People don't love bad ads. People don't like bad TV shows, bad food. And so there are ways to do this well. Plenty of examples of where you can see text messages from brands working. The article was pointing out there are moments when SMS is really clutch, like when a flight moves its gate or a shipment is delayed. And then Sarah Varney, Chief Marketing Officer of Attentive, an SMS marketing platform, also saying a few others include sending loyal customers special deals, educating folks, or alerting them when an item becomes available that they want it. So it's as everything in life, it's about doing it the right way. For me, texting is my safe space, unless if I opt in for a brand communications, mm -hmm. if I were to get a, a text from a random company I haven't heard of that immediately put a, a bad taste in my mouth and I yeah. would not shop from them. Yeah. So very, very opt true. in for a company you want to hear from. All right. Okay. can be very timely, but if not, I, I would not approve. Yeah, certainly can backfire. That's all we've got time for for this episode. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Zach. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you to Oscar. Thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, thank you to Lance, who's editing this episode. Victoria out on vacation. James, thank you to him. He copy edits the show and Stuart runs the team. Thanks to everyone for listening in to the Behind the Numbers Daily, an e-marketing podcast made possible by Verisk Marketing Solutions. You can tune in tomorrow for the Reimagining Retail Show, hosted by Sarah Lebo, where she'll be speaking to and Principal Analyst Susie David Canyon, and also Senior Analyst Zach Stambor, all about what's going on with back to school shopping. One more shout out. Uh oh. I'd like to give a big congratulations to my brother Eric, who at this point uh, will be happily engaged. So, shout out Eric and Laura. Congratulations. Congrats, folks. Yes, congrats. Indeed.